All right. Hello, everyone. Good day. My name is Ralph Slaymaker, and I'm joined by Amir Zamora to talk today about open source uh, in your SD-WAN strategy. Um, I recognize a few of the names of, of people joining uh, who I saw at the World SD-WAN Conference that I chaired in Berlin back in December. And actually funny, that's the last time I actually traveled overseas uh, before all this craziness occurred. But what's not so crazy is the role of open source in your SD-WAN strategy. So I'm a big believer in open source and I believe open source is becoming mature enough to move into the networking market. And uh, open source has really changed the ecosystem and markets in other areas of IT. And it's uh, now moving down into the uh, infrastructure, including networking. And so we're gonna talk about that today. So uh, first of all, to introduce myself, for those of you who don't know me, um, I've got a bachelor's and master's in telecom engineering. I've been working on IP networking for over 30 years. I started doing uh, SD-WANs in 2012, um, covered them while I was a Gartner analyst. Um, I now work for TechVision Research, which is a bunch of ex-Gartner analysts, and we go very deeply in uh, topics including networking and security. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I was also the uh, conference chair for the World SD-WAN Conference uh, in Berlin. And um, the, the SD-WAN market is, is very fascinating. Um, I recently published a 90-page uh, report on SD-WANs that uh, will be made available for uh, you attendees free of charge. So Amir will send out the link to that. And in that paper, you know, I sort of... Uh, review where the market is, what are some of the opportunities and the challenges. And one thing that um, was a conclusion that a lot of people agree with is that every SD-WAN is different. And so the ability to be able to customize and tailor your SD-WAN is very important. I'll now turn it over to my co-host Amir to introduce himself. Thanks, Sorel. So uh, Amir Zamora, I'm the CEO and co-founder of SexyWAN. I've been dealing with SD-WAN since around 2013. Uh, did some consultancy work around it as part of that. I had uh, uh, the great opportunity to help bring up the, I would say the first SD-WAN and the biggest SD-WAN conference uh, in Europe. And through that, I also had the opportunity to speak with many service providers, big, small, MSPs, and also even uh, en enterprises. And from the service providers, I heard the common message and the message uh, or the quote, if I would uh, say so, I heard from a few was, we simply resell a vendor, we have no way, to, no way to differentiate. Basically what they mean is they take an SD-WAN solution from one of the big vendors and they just resell it. They can add value through bundling of other services or support, but not more than that. And that's a big pain point for them. And I'll cover that a little bit through my slides. Uh, additionally, through my career, I had a previous startup that did uh, large-scale video broadcasting. And uh, before that, I was VP products and marketing for the technology business unit of uh, Radvision. And I uh, like to blog. I have my personal blog, which actually I didn't write there for a long time because I write mainly today on FlexiWan's blog, but I need to go back to that one as well. Back to you, Sorel. Thanks, Amir. So today we're going to talk about the WAN market and is it going backwards and, and cover about the hype of SD-WANs and sort of cover, well, okay, we've got the hype, but what's the reality? And is a standard required? So we're going to go into a lot of detail on why there's not a, a, a protocol standard for the SD-WAN overlay and why we need to create one. And, and one of the big questions and one of the theses of this uh, presentation is, uh, um, can we create a de facto SD-WAN standard using open source? And then we're going to talk about why that is or maybe not uh, possible. And, and why, if it is possible, it's so important in the market dynamics of SD-WANs. And then we'll hear about uh, a FlexiWAN and what they're doing in the open source SD-WAN space, uh, why uh, they're relevant and how they differentiate themselves. And then we'll also uh, uh, take some Q&A. Um, Amir, before we get started, do you want to talk about a few of the logistics as we go through this uh, webinar? 
Okay, yes, thank you. So uh, just uh, to note, this webinar is recorded and we will be providing a link to the recording uh, probably at the end of today. Additionally, um, you can see at the bottom of your screen the option for Q&A and for chat. Anything you want to ask us, please do it through the Q&A so we can actually look at one place and do that. Uh, if there are some chat messages you want to play around with and you can do that in the chat, but questions Q&A is better to have there. All right, talking about the hype of SD-WAN. So everyone's excited about software-defined wide area networks because they're gonna allow us to do four things. They're gonna allow us to be independent of transport. So I can use internet, I can use MPLS, I can use ethernet private line, I can use wireless. So I'm really a transport type agnostic. Um, I can uh, be service provider um, agnostic. So I can mix and match uh, various MPLS uh, service providers if I want to, or different ISPs. I'm no longer beholden to the segmentation of a specific VRF and MPLS. I can actually, when I create the SD-WAN overlay, uh, um, be agnostic on the uh, service provider and transport underlay. Uh, the third is I can be and utilize commodity hardware. So I can use whether it's off the shelf hardware for my branch office or virtualized or um, cloud compute resources in my data centers and my cloud hosting locations. So I can use commodity hardware and not stuck with the proprietary hardware of the past where we just stack pizza boxes of hardware uh, uh, within our uh, data centers and our uh, various uh, telecom uh, rooms. And then the fourth thing is cloud management where we can actually quickly um, add and, and change services, increase automation, intelligence, add new AI features and other things. And, and what this uh, delivers is a network that's faster, better, cheaper, and more secure. We all want things to be faster, better, cheaper. And now security is top of mind. So it used to be just faster, better, cheaper, and security was part of better. But because security is so important in this digital world, we're making it one of the top line benefits. So how can SD-WANs make your network faster? First of all, not only being transport agnostic, but also uh, uh, stopping the uh, um, backhauling or the hairpinning through data centers so that you can route your users wherever they are directly to uh, where the applications are. So today, a lot of enterprises try to have their users within 25 milliseconds of round trip time to the applications. And over time, as augmented reality and the next generation of applications uh, come, we're gonna wanna actually reduce that so that uh, uh, your users are just a few milliseconds away from the applications that they consume. The second big benefit is better, and, and better is defined as simpler and more reliable. So simplicity is being able to use a GUI-based tool to be able to point and click and add additional features. Uh, um, you know, zero-touch provisioning, I always like to call it uh, low-touch, uh, so that we can uh, ship a box out, people uh, connect a few cables, and we're up and going. Uh, the solution phones home, gets its configuration, and uh, with minimal effort uh, is added into the network. More reliable is being able to, within a, a, a sub-second, reroute around a brownout. You know, one thing that we're seeing a lot in the internet is unlike traditional networks, you know, 10, 20 years ago, where you used to have hard outages that you would have to route around. In the internet, we don't have as many blackouts. We have a lot of brownouts. Brownouts are where we're not packing, passing all the packets at the rate that they need to be. So we might go three, five, 10 seconds where packets are not being forwarded and being dropped or they're uh, only part of them are being forwarded. And we need to be able to route around those bottlenecks uh, um, quickly. Third is cheaper, you know, having the best total cost of ownership. So uh, um, by being service provider agnostic, commodity, using commodity hardware, uh, um, using new licensing models, and hopefully fewer support resources, we can reduce the costs of our wide area networks. Uh, one trivia fact for you is wide area networks represent 
on average about 10% of an enterprise's IT budget. And many reports, including some of the reports I've published, say that by moving to SD-WANs, organizations can reduce their WAN costs by 50%. So that, you know, 5% of the IT budget can be moved and utilized in other places to help the business grow in this digital world. And lastly, more secure. So since security is top of mind, we want to make sure that we're encrypting all data in motion, that we're following a zero trust model and providing that more granular end-to-end -end segmentation and being able to create network best uh, baselines and do anomaly detection to see if there's malware or users who are um, not uh, doing appropriate things or hacking on the network. But even though we have all this hype around SD-WANs, you know, and on the left-hand side, we're talking about the market objectives, there is also a market reality. So let's first uh, talk through the market objectives. So we all want solutions, uh, whether it's SD-WAN or other type of, of computing um, solutions and application solutions that are simple. We don't want them to be consistent, reliable, cost-effective, secure. We want them to be an evolution of what we have. Uh, in the networking space, we have a dream of being able to push buttons so I can click a mouse or uh, go to my uh, uh, management screen and just move things around and I can add things, reduce things, increase bandwidth, decrease bandwidth. You know, part of the great things of uh, uh, the cloud is I can spin up and spin down servers and computes and, and services in seconds. And, and we want to bring that to the um, the networking markets. And we want everything to be interoperable so that our network can connect to everything that's out there, not just things within our private network. But the market reality is there's no IETF protocol standards. So the, for the uh, first time in roughly 25 years since the uh, uh, early 90s, we are putting stuff on the network that does not have an IETF protocol standard. So a lot of you who've been around in networking for a long time remember Novell IPX, Apple Talk, DeckNet, all these uh, protocols. And back in the mid 90s, we made the decision that IP and BGP were going to be the networking plumbing that we're going to use to connect everything. So as we look at um, SD WANs, why we still have all these standards at the underlay, you know, in the you know MPLS in the IP networking. Um, we do not have a uh, IETF defined protocol standard in the overlay. So we have organizations out there that are defining what are the attributes of SD-WANs, how do we create standard um, REST APIs to manage SD-WANs, but no one's really tackling how do I create a protocol standard uh, for the SD-WAN overlay. Because without a protocol standard, we end up where we were, you know, 25 plus years ago, that we're getting locked into proprietary vendor solutions. That when I try to take a Velo SD WAN and have it talk to a, a Viptela or other type of SD WAN product, the two don't directly peer. I have to fall back to the least common denominator of good old IP BGP, and all those um, SD WAN overlay features are lost. Um, so all the additional security, all the difference of performance, all that type of stuff is lost. The other uh, big disadvantage is when dealing with these proprietary solutions is they basically create a big bloated software stack. And there are a lot of use cases out there where I might only need 5% of the functionality. So why do I have to buy this bigger hardware box? or allocate more CPU and memory resources on my virtualized boxes when I only need to use a subset of the features. So um, today you get big software stacks and we're saying, hmm, if we can get rid of this, we can actually do better than that. And then lastly is SD-WANs today are a revolution, meaning I have to rip and replace. I go out there and replace all my hardware at all my uh, branch sites. Um, I'm putting in new software and stuff like that. So um, it's, it's very hard, and especially on the SD-WAN projects I've been on, is when you have a brownfield, meaning that I've got some sites that are on SD-WAN and some that are not, and having everything work together, um, it, it, uh, 
it creates quite a lot of confusion, uh, um, a lot of outages, uh, which no one wants, and, and there's got to be a better way. So why is this interoperability so important? If you ever think of, of and dissect, you know, an enterprise network, it's really a conglomeration of many sub-networks. You have the networks that interconnect the data centers. So the data center interconnects. You have the connections that go out to the large campuses or manufacturing uh, sites. You have a lot of branch offices or retail stores and smaller offices. You've got people working from home and on the road. You've got partner networks. You've got the good old internet. And now we have all these cloud providers. And so, um, as an enterprise network, we have to go out and connect all these different um, application services and users. And ultimately, what we have to do um, as a, a good network architect and a good network manager is interconnect all these networks so that we can ensure that users going to the applications that they are consuming or users talk to other users that we can control that end-to-end -end security and performance and costs. And it's that end-to-end -end that is of value instead of just having point solutions. So if I'm just doing SD-WAN from my retail store to my data center, I'm really not getting all the advantages of when my point of sale needs to talk to and get verification for a Visa transaction or that you know, I'm going from a retail store to an inventory application that's out, hosted out there in the cloud. If I'm only doing SD-WAN as part of my network, I'm not really doing that end-to-end -end security, which has you know, segmentation. I'm not doing the end-to-end -end performance. I'm only doing it for part of the network or on the edge of the network. So part of our thesis here is that we need to look beyond what SD-WAN does today and look at the holistic solution. And the holistic solution is being able to inter-network across all these networks so that my users, no matter what network they are on, and my applications, no matter what their network they're on, that we can provide that end-to-end -end user experience and security uh, um, between all these um, inter-networks. So, is open source the answer? So we've got on the left-hand side, the SD-WAN networking revolution. We've got open source, which is revolutionizing every other part of IT. So let's bring the two together and say, hey, is there a lot of synergies that, uh, uh, with those? And so we're here today to say, we believe that there is. And, and this is still early days uh, um, in both markets. Uh, uh, open source within networking is just uh, uh, coming to fruition. SD-WANs are gaining a lot of traction, but they're still only a small percentage of the overall networking implementations uh, that are out there uh, in the world today. So by combining these two, we feel that there's a huge opportunity uh, uh, between the two to be able to rep revolutionize how networks are built and run today. So what would an open source uh, SD-WAN protocol look like? First of all, in this overlay, let's use some of the existing IETF standards. So things that are out there like IPsec, VXLAN, network services, uh, NSH. Let's use all of those that exist in our well-defined protocols and combine those and add some APIs and create an SD-WAN technology stack that is open and available to everyone. Let's leverage some of the existing open source that exists today. So there are open source um, IP networking and IPsec and other solutions uh, um, available on the market today. And we can use that and their libraries in those communities to help create this open source SD-WAN protocol stack. Let's keep it modular because not every use case needs everything. There are times when my uh, um, use cases are going to need just a little bit of functionality and there's other times I'm going to have very complex uh, um, stuff. So let's be able to pick and choose what features, functions, uh, um, and scalability that we need. Let's be able to offer turnkey solutions. 
So for those service providers and others that want to be able to create solutions for their customers, because their customers ultimately are not in the business of networking, their customers from a service provider perspective are out there, you know, bringing things to the market, whether they're applications or products uh, um, to market, and they want turnkey solutions. So let's empower um, the large enterprises to be able to create their own solutions for network service providers to be able to create uh, uh, bundled solutions to, uh, for those who want a turnkey solutions. And, and let's create an ecosystem that continues to allow this to grow and expand. So if we can't create a IETF standard for the SD-WAN overlay, let's at least create and, and, and grow a community on what we have today and use open source to create a de facto standard. So that open source becomes the de facto standard of the SD-WAN overlay that everyone can still build on. So I'm not saying get rid of your current SD-WAN vendors. I'm saying, hey, all you SD-WAN vendors, let's all create a common foundation and then we can still add other things that add differentiation and value in the market. Let's not go back to just plain IPBGP anytime I need two SD-WAN solutions to talk to each other. We need to be able to create that SD-WAN overlay uh, foundation for everyone to be able to uh, uh, do that end-to-end -end security encryption, segmentation, uh, performance. So one of the examples of things that we can add into this standardized uh, uh, SD-WAN overlay is VXLAN. So VXLAN is used commonly today in data centers. Uh, VLANs by themselves don't really scale uh, a VLAN. Uh, I think you only have 4,096 of them, whereas with VXLAN you can have 16 plus million uh, uh, segments. Uh, you can do both layer two and layer three uh, uh, tunneling. Uh, there's a lot of power that VXLAN has brought into data centers and, and products like Cisco ACI, uh, VMware NSX are using VXLAN to provide north-south and east-west segmentation within the data centers. So what we're saying is, hey, as we create this uh, standard SD-WAN overlay, let's take IPSec, which pretty much every SD-WAN vendor is doing, add VXLAN and, and some other uh, common standard uh, um, components and create this foundation so that we can take the segmentation that is residing in data centers, put it on the WAN, use VXLAN at our remote sites, and then being able to do this, this micro-segmentation end-to-end so that my point-of-sale server that's running in my branch office can use the same segment on the local area network as the wide area network as the data center and, and in the cloud and then with the third party so that I am then creating this end-to-end -end segment specific for um, point of sale and let's say Visa transaction that's PCI compliant that I can control the end-to-end -end security and visibility and performance of uh, um, not just have these point solutions. And, and so we're a big advocate of taking these components that we have today and pushing them into that, S, that, that standard SD-WAN overlay and being able to provide that end-to-end -end, uh, networking capability. So is open source the future of SD-WANs? Well, I certainly believe so. And hopefully you guys believe so who are on this call or at least considering it. But there are a lot of people out here that say, nope, it's not going to happen. Open source has been around for decades. Open source and networking, now well, just never happened. You know, we've got big vendors out there. They're going to continue to have the proprietary solutions. So let's have this argument. So let's take, first of all, yes. Yes, open source is the future of software-defined networks. Why? Because the plumbing's already there. We've got a lot of good IETF standards that we can leverage. We have a strong market desire uh, uh, by a lot of service providers and enterprises looking for solutions that don't lock them into a specific vendor and a proprietary source. So if I go out and select XYZ SD-WAN vendor today, and in two years, um, they start charging too much or they fall behind in their features 
or, or a number of other reasons, I don't want to have to be locked in to that specific uh, vendor. I want freedom of choice, just like I have freedom of choice on which service provider I use, what type of transport I use, what type of hardware is used. This freedom of choice is very important. And then finally is zero trust networking. So as security becomes one of the top priorities of uh, um, networking, we're seeing more and more of the firewall vendors getting into the networking space and following this SASE model where the uh, um, secure access services edge, where we're now applying the appropriate routing and security policies to every session that users are going to their applications that they're consuming. That we're not saying that everything going across this link is gonna have the same network WAN optimization or the same security functions. That we're gonna do so more intelligently application by application, segment by segment, uh, um, so that we're not using a whole bloated stack. We're actually applying exactly what is needed for every flow or session versus just applying it to the link. Okay, let's look at the other side of this coin. No. So traditional vendors are gonna to continue to push fear, uncertainty, and doubt, FUD. And we'll say, nope, it's gonna to be too painful. You wanna to continue to use our solution. We've been in your network for 25 years. You're embedded it. You've got certification in us. Why would you ever want to look at anything else? Uh, we're your one-stop shop. We'll do all things for you. And uh, uh, disregard this bill that we send you once a year and all the maintenance and all the other costs that we throw in there. Uh, um, we, we keep your network and your business running. Some other people argue, well, IP BGP is good enough, and we're just going to use SD-WAN on the edge of our technology. That is going to be more of an access. Then I'm going to use SD-WAN to help me in the last mile. So I'll go from my branch office uh, um, through the last mile to an edge data center, whether that's mine or one of the many in the cloud. And then once I'm there, I'm going to ride that vendor's IP BGP backbone. So I'm just using SD-WAN as an access uh, solution and I'm not using it really to do that in the end networking. I'm just using it to get onto the big IP BGP networks that exist today in a more cost effective secure way in the last mile. And lastly, uh, others will say, well, yeah, networking is just plumbing and we're going to take all that complexity of networking and we're going to hide it behind these new tools. So I'm going to go use Ansible and I'm going to make everything push button and all this stuff that's behind networking will all be happen automatically and users won't know, need to know a command line interface and all the right commands. They won't need to actually go in and, and do anything with the network. We'll just mask that network complexity. So you're not fixing the problem, you're just masking it with these uh, overlay tools that uh, will allow people to have that push button resources that they desire. So I want now to talk a little bit about market dynamics and then, and then I'll shift over to FlexiWAN. So first to start, Everybody knows that the SD-WAN market is a crowded market. We have like between 60 to 70 vendors out there, depending on how exactly you count. And if I'll quote a, a comment I got from an analyst, not from Sorel actually, somebody from the Silicon Valley, uh, who said to me the following, said SD-WAN vendors are competing on marginal features. And then he added, you FlexiWAN, you're doing something different, which was very flattering. But if we focus here on the first part of his sentence, it's very hard today for an SD-WAN vendor to do what the goldfish here is doing, and that is to stick out. Um, and when I look at the vendors and what they're doing, I consider these as cookie cutter solutions. When I say cookie cutter solutions, I'm not trying to say that they're all doing the exact same thing, that they're all using the same technology. No, there are advantages and disadvantages to each vendor. But in general, they're trying to take the concepts and the paradigm of the past, of the old networking concepts and bring them into SD-WAN. This means they're trying to create a closed solution that you cannot change. They try as much as possible to bundle hardware and software. And yes, of course, you can find many options to install SD-WAN on virtual machines in the cloud and so forth. But when you go to the vendor, the first option 
that they would try is to give you a bundle of software and hardware, especially if it's something that you take and install uh, in one of your physical locations. And, and through this, lock you in through, for a longer term contract of at least three years or something like three years and try to bring only a single vendor into the enterprise. And the single vendor thing is done in the following way. They bundle as many capabilities as possible in one big software stack. So you can see here things like DPI and WAN optimization, security and other stuff. Now, reality is, and you know very well, there are companies that are experts in some of these areas and technologies. And there is no reason whatsoever that a service provider or an enterprise should be forced to use all, the all of these technologies from one single vendor. Okay, now of course, yes, there are some things that can run as VMs next to it, but not everything. The way to do that is that these vendors just put a big lock on the software box and they go for the take it or leave it approach. This is what we have, this is what you need to use. If we look at the reality, and that relates to what Sorel said at the beginning, it's not a one size fits all type of solution. Meaning we can have enterprise requirements anywhere along this line between what you see on the right hand side, which is centrally managed IPsec tunnels. That's how you create those connections between the different locations, centrally manage them, routing protocols, zero touch provisioning, uh, lifecycle management of these edge devices with software upgrade and everything around that. All the way to the left hand side, which is the fully uh, featured or bolted uh, Z1 solution. And reality is anywhere in between, but never at the same place. Each enterprise has special requirements, sometimes even inside the enterprise, as the slide that Sorel showed with the different types of locations and sites, uh, they can have different requirements in the same enterprise. To make things worse for the service provider, when an enterprise goes and searches for SD-WAN, similar to voice over IP, where the revenue of the service providers was hit dramatically because today, an enterprise can go and buy a voice over IP service from someone and only buy the broadband from the service provider. This is what we start to see now when people move from MPLS to broadband and SD-WAN. You buy the connectivity, the pipe, but you can buy the SD-WAN directly from the SD-WAN vendor. And that's why service providers view the ability to differentiate as a key factor for their survival. This is very critical. And that's something that is very hard to do with the existing solutions. So when you look at the threat for the service providers and even for the MSPs is to become resellers, that sentence I quoted before uh, from some service providers, they do not want to become resellers in pipes. And even MSPs, mid-sized, small ones, they have a problem today with some of the large vendors that they cannot really add value. So the customer has no reason to buy from them. So let's talk a little bit about FlexiWAN. Our mission is to disrupt and democratize the SD-WAN market. And we do this with two major differentiators. One is the fact that we're open source. You can go to the, today to our website, go to the open source page. You'll see there a button to download the software. You'll get a link or you, uh, to download it, or you can simply go to GitLab and find it there by yourself. And you'll find there the complete solution, except for our billing engine and except for the UI layer of the management, only the UI. The, all the management logic is part of the open source. Uh, the other part is the modular architecture. And that's something I spoke about a lot, uh, wrote about this and, and spoke about this also in some briefings. And you could see some articles that relate to it. And it's not always understood to the full extent and to the promise and the revolution that, is in, uh, that it's uh, introducing. So this slide will describe that in much more detail. We, have, we are slicing SD-WAN actually to horizontal layers. The base layer is what we call the networking infrastructure. These are those IPsec tunnels connecting between different locations, centrally managed, routing protocols, so forth and so on, as I described before. This is a very big layer. It's not simple at all, but it's the foundation on which you can build the system somewhere around what Sorel mentioned before as the baseline of the standard that can be, okay? Not 100% exactly, but very close to that. On top of that, we have what we call the application framework. And this is actually a layer that allows you through an SDK to dynamically load applications 
that run in the edge, meaning the router, in the data flow of the router, or in the management. This means that with this capability, you can actually be anywhere along the requirements line of the enterprise. Not only that, you can dynamically change this. And the beauty of this is that this is different from VNFs. We also work with some partners for VNF integration, but this is different from VNF because in this case, you can actually even run bare metal. The idea is that these things are fully integrated dynamically into the system itself. With this, you can look at FlexiWAN as the Android of routers because I can compare it to the mobile phone revolution. We claim that the networking world of today is actually compared to what you have seen in the past in the feature phone world of mobile phones. You got to a, net, a vendor like Nokia or somebody else, you got a phone, these are the capabilities, that's it, this is what you can use. If today somebody would offer you a phone that for messaging you can do only WhatsApp, or if you wanna do something else like Messenger or Hangouts, you need to buy a different phone, I don't think anybody would buy this phone. So this is exactly the revolution that we're gonna do. We're bringing the smartphone revolution to the networking space, allowing for choice for our customers. With this, we bring four major benefits to our customers. First of all, by design, it's cheaper. If you saw, if you, if you remember what Sorel mentioned before, the big software stacks that require more expensive hardware, more expensive software, even large vendors in some of their solutions have sub-licensed software elements. And you are paying royalties for those sub-licensed elements, whether you, you use them or not, and your hardware becomes more expensive, again, exactly the same way. This is something I heard actually from service providers, mid-sized service providers in Europe and other places that tell me that there are some deployments they just cannot go with the existing large uh, software stacks that they have and they actually have in their network. And that's why they're going for multi-vendor in the SD-WAN space. Second, we have an efficient business model. We'll talk about this a bit more in the next slide. It's not only the fact that it's open source, it's very, very easy to access no, no, no real, no contracts, nothing. Next is removing vendor lock. I spoke about that before when I spoke about the open source and the open architecture, allowing to add differentiation. This is exactly what the service providers want. And uh, actually we have cases today of service providers not, that not only want some of specific applications to be integrated into their solution, but they are actually building things around FlexiWAN in order to provide something different for their customers. Last but not least is future-proof. This relates also to what Sorel mentioned before about the uh, uh, rip and replace or that you can actually grow the system. A few things that we do here. One, first of all, the application framework. This allows you to integrate new technologies like safe driving networks and other things into the system without fully replacing. Second, we are not tying you to a specific hardware. We are not selling hardware, we're only selling software. And you can see on our website, various hardware uh, partners. We just had an announcement yesterday with Lanner, but we have others like Advantech and Silicon and Quanta and others. And we have customers who are just taking our software and putting it on hardware that they already have. As long as it complies with the system requirements, they're free to use it. We're not making money on the hardware. That's the idea. And we're giving them much more choice. With regards to the business model, if you'll go to our website, you'll see pricing. That's very strange in the SD-WAN market. Nobody is publishing their pricing. It's the best kept secret. We decide to take a different approach. Pricing is available. Everybody can see it. Very, very simple. It's not bandwidth based. It's only based on the number of sites that you actually had in a specific month and you do not need to commit or anything like that. So there are three options that are described in a, in a blog post that you can find the link to it on the pricing page. First, when you, go to our, when you come to our website, you can open a free account. And we have way over a thousand companies that opened an account, something between 1,300 to 1,500, that opened an account on our system for free. You can run up to three instances of Flexi Edge without uh, paying anything. Then if you want more, you can just put in a credit card and pay month by month. Second is what we call a dedicated environment. The first one was a shared environment. So it's a multi-tenant system. 
but you are on the same server that others are on, uh, as common in SaaS models. In the dedicated environment, we spin up the complete set of servers for you on AWS, and you can go ahead and put your logo there, it's a complete white label, your domain can be mapped there. And also here, no long-term commitment, you can stop at any time, there's just a minimum fee, which is not so big. Third is the self-hosting. Usually people move from dedicated to self-hosting as their deployment grows, because from the customer point of view, they don't see any difference, okay? But for you, you can actually have better control, but there we do require some larger commitment because there's a lot of effort that we need to put into it. Uh, we have great market coverage, actually. Uh, if you've seen PR we had with Telefonica, they're also a, a minority share investment in, investor in our company, uh, articles by Light Reading, um, very good uh, relationship we have with Intel. There are several solution briefs uh, that Intel has released. There's also going to be a performance document that Intel will release uh, a performance of FlexiWAN that we did not test. It was tested by Telefonica, actually. And First Telecom, that actually did an incredible job uh, writing about us. And we thank all of those publishers and many more that I couldn't mention here for the coverage. All right. So what we do know is that the current SD-WAN environment as it does exist today is not sustainable. That first of all, we've got over 60 vendors in the space. And you know the SD-WAN market by itself is, is growing, but it's just a few billion dollar uh, market because at the end of the day, uh, um, it's just gonna be software. And uh, uh, how can you have 60 uh, plus vendors sustain uh, um, their growth and uh, in this highly competitive environment? So we know that those things are gonna change, that there's a high risk that many of these vendors will either get acquired um, or go out of business. And uh, it'll be sad when some of those vendors go out of business and the service providers or enterprises that selected those vendors all of a sudden find themselves uh, uh, with a closed solution that they purchased uh, no longer being supported and they have to go through another rip and replace. As we mentioned earlier, those rip and replaces are very uh, uh, timely. They take a lot of time and uh, costly and introduce a lot of uh, reliability and other challenges. Second, uh, SD-WANs today are primarily used at the edge of networks, not in backbones. You don't really see uh, anyone out there running a 100 gig SD-WAN. That typically SD-WANs are speeds at one gig and below. And sometimes people aggregate into, you know, upwards of 10 gig um, as they aggregate into the data center. But no uh, service provider, no large enterprises is using SD-WAN in their backbones in the 100 gig plus uh, links. Um, Third, um, really, if SD-WAN is going to succeed and fill its uh, promise of being agnostic of hardware, transport, and service provider, it's got to provide that last thing. It's got to be agnostic of the uh, uh, software stack, that we've got to be able to create this open source SD-WAN um, overlay that becomes the de facto standard in the market. So that yes, we're gonna to continue to have a highly competitive market with other vendors, but we wanna be able to take the very solutions out there and have them at a minimum um, be able to pass segmentation, security, performance, and other uh, features uh, um, at that standard SD-WAN overlay uh, level versus going back to the IP BGP um, underlay. And we feel, um, and as part of it, as an analyst looking at the market, I feel that there's a huge opportunity for open source to come in and fill that role as a de facto standard since we do not have an SD-WAN overlay IETF protocol standard. Last comment, Sorel. Now I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Um, we're part of an open source networking community and we're looking for others to join us. Uh, we believe open source is going to play a very important uh, uh, role as uh, networking moves forward uh, here in the next decade. Okay. Um, so I would like to thank everybody as well. And also thanks to uh, people who uh, commented now in the chat as well. And uh, hope to see you again uh, in our future webinars. And uh, you will be receiving an email with the link to the recording and also to the report. Great day, thank you.